Hello, everybody. Thanks again for coming and welcome to another session. Um, today we have Dr. Um, Chipman. Um, I'm going to let him kind of introduce himself and then we can kind of go. You can take as long as you want to answer the questions and then people can either um, put them in the chat if they have a specific questions or and we also have like a set of questions that we could ask as well. So I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay. Well, my name is Jeffrey Chipman. I'm a what's called today uh, an acute care surgeon. Uh, acute care surgery has three components to it. It usually is trauma, uh, surgical critical care, and emergency general surgery. And then usually everyone does, I guess not usually, but a lot of people will have sort of another practice. And my practice, um, part of my practice is taking care of um, doing routine general surgery things on patients who have uh, underlying uh, significant disease. So somebody who has a really bad heart or really bad lungs and has appendicitis or needs their gallbladder out, then I deal with that. And then I deal with patients who are, um, have had a lot of complications with, of, of abdominal surgery and need reconstruction or revision um, so that's my practice. Um, I'm also uh, a professor of surgery, so I have a research component of what I do. It generally revolves around surgical infections, surgical education, and some global surgery things. And then um, I have a very large administrative role right now. I am the executive medical director for the critical care domain, which for M Health Fairview. So. For all nine M Health Fairview hospitals, I'm responsible for um, critical care in all of them. Um, a kind of a general question, but what kind of out of all the specialties out there, what kind of made you choose um, surgery? Because it can be really intensive and long, the residency. And what about critical care kind of motivated you to choose that specialty? I was trying to decide between internal medicine and surgery. I didn't want to do surgery because as you say, the training is too long and it's too intense. Um, and I was really trying to find my space in internal medicine, but I wasn't able to do that. Um, I finally admitted to myself that I was more like the surgeons than I was the internists in medical school. And I also realized that I like projects and finishing them and moving on and not um, sort of increasing drug doses for someone's, till someone dies. So I liked my packages tied up with a little bow and given away never to see again. And then critical care I didn't really discover critical care till I was a surgical resident. It was the most popular rotation in my medical school. And I didn't, I, you had to lottery to get into it and I didn't get a good lottery spot, so I didn't do it. Um, but when I did critical care as a resident, I realized that was the best part of internal medicine and everything I liked about internal medicine and not the stuff I didn't like and surgery together. And to me, that was the best. It, it made me an, a, a complete um, physiologist, which is what I liked about internal medicine, and it still let me operate. Um, what about, um, like, how does your day go, like, um, usual day, like, start and end as, like, your job? I don't have a usual day. Every day is different, and that's one of the good things and bad things about my job. So I'll tell you the last uh, four or five days of my job. Um, Wednesday last week, I spent a lot of time doing administration. Uh, Thursday and Friday, I was uh, one of the doctors at Bethesda Hospital um, in one of the ICUs at Bethesda taking care of the COVID patients. And I did that Wednesday or Thursday and Friday all day from seven to seven. And um, during that time, dealt with a lot of the systems issues at the same time. So 
luckily I had good help and assistance who paid close attention to the patients while I was on the telephone a lot of the day. Yesterday I started with meetings, then I had a clinic where I saw new complicated general surgery patients. Um, and then today I started at Bethesda at about 645. Um, and I ran grand rounds uh, virtually for the department of surgery and then had uh, a meeting with the chief medical officer at nine o'clock um, and some other administrative meetings till just now. And then this weekend I'm on call at the university. I'll be in the intensive care unit on Saturday and Sunday from seven until six. As you mentioned, being a surgeon and being involved with research and all the other aspects, um, how would you, would you say you find balance and kind of relaxing and finding balance between working and family life, if there, if there ever is a balance? How do you kind of strike balancing all those things? Um, I don't know that there's a good answer to that because I don't think surgeons in particular, but physicians in general have very good balance. Um, I think that you have, you sacrifice things. There's things you just can't do. And um, you have to put them on hold and you have to look and say, what are my priorities and what, do, what really matters here? And how much does it matter? What am I willing to sacrifice on either side to do what I wanna do? Um, and and pe you'll find people from all across the spectrum, surgeons who sort of work 50% of the time and the rest of the time they're fishing or whatever. And then people who only uh, do work. Um, one question we got in the chat box is what are some of your most interesting cases that you've got? Um, well, COVID's been very interesting to discover um, and to learn how to take care of lately. Um, you know, a lot of the cases I have are complications from other people's operations and then the patients get really sick and get sent to the university. Um, so the patients who have hernias, big hernias in the front with intestine leaking through the hernia called a fistula. Um, that's a lot of what my general surgery practice is, is taking those down, fixing the holes, and then trying to close the abdominal wall in front. Um, we also have a lot of pre-physician assistants. So can you talk about how, like, as your uh, point of view from being a doctor, how does it, um, how is your relationship with a physician assistant and what are your thoughts on that career from like a doctor's point of view? I'll, I'll talk more about what we call advanced practice providers. Um, so uh, in practically speaking, a physician's assistant really functions in the hospital no differently than a nurse practitioner. And we rely on them a lot. Um, they tend to do a lot of the uh, routine work. So when I say uh, last week I did a lot of administrative work while I was at Bethesda, I had a nurse practitioner who was kind of keeping track of everything that was going on in the hospital. And um, when she needed help, she would call me and say, this one I don't know what to do with but all the other questions that she knew how to handle, she just took care of. Um, so we work uh, quite closely with advanced practice providers and taking care of patients in the hospital. I don't do a lot with them in the clinic or in the operating room, uh, largely because when I operate, I'm operating with a resident um, and they kind of take the role of a advanced practice provider in the operating room. And another question we've asked a lot of surgeons is, um, is how like machines and computers are changing the game of surgery. 
because we know that like they're getting more involved in surgery and how um, is it getting changed in critical care and like acute surgery? Um, for critical care, there's a lot of machine learning happening and trying to identify problems but based on trends before the problems show up and can be identified. So predictive modeling, um, a lot of modeling about what the best drugs would be to take care of a certain situation. For example, um, which antibiotic to use based on what's going on in your hospital at the time. Um, machines and computers in the operating room, probably the biggest things are robots and robots are still trying to define their space and that space has um, has evolved over time as robots uh, have come onto the market and will continue to evolve. Uh, a lot of people are doing a lot of general surgery. So robots can be very good, um, but in many ways they aren't any better than just plain old laparoscopic surgery. Uh, and, and for example, one of the operations that was really touted to be um, the best operation for a robot was a robotic prostatectomy. But one of the things that was discovered is that the rate of the, it was almost too good of an operation in that um, because you could see so well and do so well, uh, most of the nerves in the lower pelvis were, were taken as part of the specimens and the rate of impotency after surgery was much higher than laparoscopic approaches. Um, with the same uh, oncologic outcome. So they've kind of lost that area now. People have gone back to just doing laparoscopic surgery rather than using robot in that area. So it's continually being evolved. And, and the important thing for someone like me is to be skeptical and say, I need to see the data to say that this is truly better and not just another way of doing the same thing the same way. because it makes it a lot more expensive. And if you look at it from a, you know, if you use it from a medical ethics lens and say one of the medical ethics principles of medical ethics is social responsibility, if it costs twice as much to do an operation and get the same outcome, um, then from a social justice point of view, uh, perhaps you shouldn't do that. You should use the other one and do twice as many operations and, re and outreach to other people. Um, another question we've gotten is, um, how do you prepare for surgery the day before, um, like right before you go into it, like mentally and like well as like getting like research and stuff done for it? A lot of times, a lot of the operations I do are become are fairly routine so I don't really think about them that much if I'm doing something that's a bit unusual what I tend to do is um, I dream about it the night before and I can't I don't sleep well and I go through all the steps in my mind over and over and over and over and over and occasionally the operation um, goes just as I had it planned in my head and just as often after the first step um, as they say in the army, no plan uh, survives the first encounter with the enemy. Okay. And um, kind of more of like a personal question, but like how do you mentally handle like death of a patient? Like does it, do like hospitals have um, like counseling for a doctor or do they not really like deal with it and you kind of just move on? That's a very good question. And it was a question that I had to ask, um, I had to address before I decided to do surgery because I knew that becoming a surgeon that I would be directly responsible for somebody's death. Maybe not causing it, but a complication from the operation I did would uh, end up in someone dying down the road as a direct result of something that I did. And I had to ask myself, would I be comfortable with that? Um, and I think um, 
for me, what I do is I remind myself continually that the patient is the one with the disease. And uh, as long as I can look at myself in the mirror and say that I did everything that I knew how to do and could have done, then I have to be okay with that. We now have systems in place to um, uh, help doctors who get into trouble. Um, so, for, and so there's a couple of us who are sort of on the telephone tree for if a surgeon has a bad outcome or a complication in the operating room, we'll get a call and say, can you reach out to Dr. So-and-so and just make sure they're okay? And if they're not, um, you know, here's some resources you can help them engage so that their mental health is protected. What I've found is that what most surgeons like is just being able to talk through the problem with somebody who understands um, and who's been in a similar situation um, so that they can have somebody to bounce the issue off of and review it and reflect and say, okay, what do I need to learn out of this? Should I have done something different? Um, and that, just doing that action, learning from it is often um, what many people need to get through it so that it doesn't happen to someone else. You mentioned earlier that you were you have various positions. Could you talk more about your administrative and research um, positions and responsibilities that you have? So the I've had various administrative responsibilities through my career. The one that I have now in critical care is I'm uh, responsible for um, well setting up the ICU part of Bethesda Hospital most recently responsible for quality improvement projects that are related to critical care. I'm responsible for problems that happen in the ICU and reviewing them and, and figuring out what went wrong and what's okay. Um, I'm responsible for uh, staffing and making sure that the ICUs have physicians that are responsible and covering. I'm sort of a an advocate for the doctors to try to get resources from the system. Um, that's my responsibility there now. And research, uh, my research efforts have sort of changed over time. For a while, they were uh, largely related to surgical education and what's the best way to train residents. Can you use simulation? We did a big project with a with the army trying to figure out the best way to train basic army medics um, using simulators rather than goats. Um, and then I'm involved with HIV research trying to find uh, what's known as the reservoir. So when you patients with HIV are treated with antiretroviral drugs, the virus becomes undetectable in the bloodstream. Um, but if they stop taking their antiretroviral medications, within a predictable 10 to 14 days, the virus comes back. So the question is, where is it coming from? And it's, that question has been elusive for many years, forever, since HIV was discovered in the early 80s until the last couple of years when we found that it, it's living and replicating actively in lymph node tissue. Um, but it's just controlled before it gets out of the lymph nodes into the bloodstream. So to do that, you need lymph node tissue and to get lymph node tissue, you have to cut holes in people to get lymph nodes. So that's where I come into. And we've been able to do it in a very inexpensive, safe uh, manner uh, through small incisions, mostly in the groin. Uh, that very few people around the world have been able to replicate. Um, but it's allowed me to travel around the world to to do the procedure and to teach others to try to do it. Um, talking about research, a lot of doctors, especially surgeons, are still heavily involved in research. Is that like a norm in surgery? Or, and, um, or is that just like something we just like surgeons like to do? 
Uh, I don't think it's true, and Matt. I don't. I, I think you're you're seeing one part of the spectrum because you're at a university. So, the people you're talking to are university people, and the reason they're here is to do research. But most doctors and surgeons are not associated with universities, and they don't do research. So, I think the people like me are are the minority of all physicians or surgeons. But I went to a medical school that emphasized research. Um, I was doing research before I went to medical school. I knew I wanted to participate in it after. And for me, this was sort of the right fit. So if you're at a university, generally your responsibility is, includes research if you're in a medical school. And um, if someone didn't want to do research in when they become doctors, do you recommend getting a PhD, MD degree, or do you think an MD would work just fine and they can still do the same amount of research? That, that is the continual and perpetual debate. Um, the vast majority of people that do research don't have their PhD. Um, it helps if you do, but a lot of times the MD PhDs are more of the PhD type rather than the MD type. So if you really want to get your MD so you sort of know how it's being applied, but not really take care of patients, then, then you do the MD PhD. If you want to be a doctor mostly and kind of help, then um, you can just do an MD. A lot of, um, you know, a lot of the MD PhDs I know uh, the PhD was sort of a waste because they're in private practice. Um, so that was a lot of money that um, we as taxpayers spent to support someone to get a PhD and to pay for their tuition. And they're now out in, at, you know, Arkansas General Hospital taking out gallbladders and appendixes and nothing more. Um, I think that if you're interested in research uh, as an MD, there's ways to do the same kind of experience research-wise, but as uh, later in your training, uh, that's equally as valuable. But that is a debate that's been going on since the beginning of academic medicine and continues to go on. So we have kind of grown up in Minnesota and from your profile, I've kind of seen that you've kind of been from different states. What about Minnesota really kind of, or about the program at the U really kind of made you choose it? Well, um, everywhere we've lived, we've loved. And when we came, we had the opportunity to come here. I said to my wife, um, you know, everyone talks about Minnesota like it's the greatest place on earth, which was true. A lot of people where I was a resident in Arizona, there's a lot of Minnesotans down there in the winter. And, um, and I said, you know, we have another friend who was a Fortune 500 head company or a headhunter for Fortune 500 companies for CEO types. And he said that he'd never been able to recruit a CEO out of Minnesota. So there was all these hints that this was a pretty awesome place to live. So I said to my wife, you know, we've liked everywhere we've lived. Chances are, and we've done well, chances are we're going to have an opportunity to stay in Minnesota. Are you okay if, with that if we go there? And, and that's exactly what happened. I've looked at a few jobs elsewhere. I was offered a job at uh, my alma mater as the chief of acute care surgery at Columbia, and I, I didn't take it. Um, uh, largely because um, on my second interview there, I was meeting with one of the chairs and she was saying, you need to bring your allies. You need to have an army when you come here. You're going to have to fight a battle every day and people are going to lose and you're going to have to conquer. I mean, literally, these were the words she was using. And I thought, wow, that sounds like sort of a hostile environment and I'm not in that now is that really what I want to take it on and then I had three teenage boys at the time and I thought 
if I'm going to do that, I'm going to have to be in the hospital all the time. And um, being gone that much is not conducive to raising teenage boys. So I decided to stay here. Um, what advice would you give to pre-med students that like could help them make their application more competitive or more um, effective applying to med school? Well, most medical schools have sort of their ideal um, candidate. So if you look at our med school's website, at least it used to say this, it, it had a essential and then desired characteristics of the University of Minnesota Medical School. I think you can find that type of information for any medical school. And then you, your application needs to demonstrate that. Um, so, and, and we used to argue in our med school, I used to be in the Dean's office. I was the assistant Dean for curriculum for about five years. And um, the, we, we would debate and argue which characteristic was more important than another. And basically it came down to you that you had to have every essential characteristic or something that demonstrated the essential characteristics. So um, you had to be able to demonstrate how you were committed to the human condition, what you'd done to show that. You couldn't just say, I'm committed to the human condition. You had to have some evidence that you've done something in your life to do that. Um, and I think that's true for every medical school. There are some schools that are really interested in creating medical scientists and, and like mine. So what got me into, uh, into Columbia was the fact that I published some really significant research um, as an undergrad. Um, and um, and had was the second author on the paper and that I could actually talk about the research that I was doing in a very informed way so that the people interviewing me realized that I wasn't just there on Tuesday and Thursday afternoon um, kind of hanging out in the lab but that I that I, the research was my research and and projects of it were my project to own and um, and so that's there are schools that are kind of interested in research and then you need to demonstrate that more than others i would say our our medical school is very interested in uh primary care and um and that kind of thing so uh for especially the duluth campus which is who, whose mission is family medicine primary care and native american health so if you go to Duluth and say, I want to be a neurosurgeon, and I've done all this neurosurgical research, um, they're going to say, yeah, you don't fit here. So even though your scores are great and everything, you're, you're not who we're looking for. Um, so you kind of have to do some investigation. You want to find out what their ideal candidate is, and then you look at yourself and say, do I fit this profile? And how can I prove it? And that's what goes in your application. And then if you want to go to a California school and you're not a California resident, good luck. You're not going to get in. Um, how do you see your specialty changing in the next 10 years? And how has it already changed since you first started being um, working there? Well, robots uh, have taken off. Uh, laparoscopic and minimally, minimally invasive surgery is much larger than when I started. But what's happening is today's residents don't know how to do some of the complicated basic operations that we used to do open that are primarily done laparoscopic now. So, uh, for example, removing the gallbladder, um, when I was a resident, uh, we were able to do about nine, of ten, nine out of 10 of them we did laparoscopically, but we, uh, the 10th one we had to open. So we did a lot of open procedures. Now uh, we only open on about one out of 100. So I have chief residents and senior residents who've never done an open gallbladder operation. Um, 
which is problematic because they're going to have to do that. So you have to, so when I was a resident, that was a second year resident case. And now it's a chief resident case, a fifth year resident case, just because they don't get to see them that often or participate in them. So the familiarity and skill level of open surgery is actually being lost with the amount of minimally invasive surgery that's being performed, which is good and bad because minimally invasive surgery has, when it works, has better outcomes. Um, but when it doesn't work, you still have to be able to open and fix it. Um, another question is mental health has kind of come into the discussion more lately. And as you said, you've trained residents. How do you um, advise them and kind of avoiding burnout and dealing with the stress of being a um, resident doctor and also to your patients as well as yourself? Um, you know, I, I, my program director, most, most programs have a, a resident counseling service as we do here. And when I was a resident, my program director at the beginning said, I expect you all to participate in this. It was an expectation that you would seek help to get through things. Um, surgery residency is really tough and, and it needs to be because there are very few um, specialties where decisions have to be made on the fly and fast and you have to live with the consequences right or wrong. And and there's not enough of us to be able to be, um, to, to have reasonable hours. And um, so, you know, we work hard hours, we work all night long, um, and you have to learn how to function in that stressful environment. And um, so you have to train in that environment. The training has to involve that kind of stress. Um, because the first time, I don't want the first time that my doctor has seen a bad car wreck is when I'm the patient on the table. Um, I want the doctor to, you know, I want it to be routine. And um, to do that, you have to do a lot of it. And, and to do a lot of it requires a lot of work and, and stress and strain. So it's trying to find that right balance between not en enough that makes you stronger, but not enough that it kills you is, I guess, the way to, to, to look at it. Just like exercise, you want to stress the body enough that it gets stronger, but that it doesn't get injured. Okay. Without violating any HIPAA laws, but what was your most memorable like patient experience whether it was really difficult or really enjoyable that you still kind of remember well i got a email this spring from um a woman who said you don't know me but i'm married to this guy and you took care of him when he was 17 he came in with a gunshot wound to the abdomen and you took out his kidney and saved his life and i just wanted to let you know that he talks about you a lot and that he listened to you after and he put his life in order and now he's married with two kids and he's a strong father and a strong husband and i thank you for doing that um and um it came in the spring when covid was really getting hairy and um it it helped me a lot and i've thought about that family a lot over the summer just because of what's happened in the Twin Cities. So I wrote her a note yesterday and she responded again and kind of expanded. And she said she and her husband were, it was late one evening and they were just talking about their lives together and how things were good and, and what had gotten them there and what they were gonna do in the future. And, and she said, I just looked your name up and I found an email, so I, wrote an email right then and there on my phone and my husband didn't even know I did it. And then you answered and it sort of took us by surprise. Um, but you know, that was very meaningful. I remember the operation vividly, um, and what went on. Um, 
was a 17 year old kid who was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, you know, trying to sow his oats a little bit and ended up getting shot. It was right. It was at the end of August. He was supposed to be the starting running back on the football team uh, in his senior year. And, and that of course didn't happen. Um, but I talked to him, I remember talking to him the next day and saying, you know, you're going to be fine. Um, you're not going to play football this year, but and we had a long talk about being in the right place at the right time. And, and that, as I told my boys, nothing good happens after midnight and, um, and all of them, you know, each of my boys would sort of look at me and roll their eyes and do the whole, yeah, whatever dad thing. And, and each of them had an experience where, you know, they came back and said, yeah, you're right, dad, as much as they could muster to say it. Um, but it was, it's gratifying to, to know that that person, not only did I help him survive um, uh, a lethal injury, um, but that it affected the rest of his life as well. Um, as you mentioned how COVID is changing things, how has COVID uh, specifically changed your um, field of medicine? And how do you think um, even after whenever this is COVID ends, how do you think it has now changed because of COVID? Well, I haven't done much surgery since February. Um, uh, my, my son got married at, in the end of February. I got back on Sunday night and Monday morning. Um, I basically got to work and, and there were all these emergency meetings being planned um, to prepare for what we were going to do for COVID. And I spent the next uh, six weeks basically uh, on the phone and on conference calls because, you know, if you recall through March, everything started to shut down. We stopped having meetings. People were working from home. Um, everything just shut down and went virtual. But um, so all my meetings just switched to being on Zoom um, and lots of them to prepare to open Bethesda Hospital and, and what we were going to do there. Um, and then part of that was all surgery was stopped because we needed to redirect the resources to COVID. And at least that's what the New York experience and Italy experience had showed us. Ours didn't happen to be that way, but you know, surgery shut down for about six to eight weeks. So I didn't operate then. And then when it came back, I was still, um, working in in the ICUs at COVID in the COVID hospital and so it, it was it wasn't until about July that I did my first um, operations again um, so that's changed my uh, immediate career immediate path my nurses uh, who plan my life um, have stopped giving me all the little easy operations and all I get is the complicated stuff the senior guy needs. Um, and going forward, COVID's going to be with us all the time. It's going to be in everybody's differential diagnosis, which is the list of possibilities that cause problems. And um, it's going to be sort of this smolder like the flu is every year, um, but it's going to be uh, rough. The important thing is we've learned a lot about it. We've learned that uh, it's a disease that the old, the elderly need to worry about. And if you have comorbid conditions, diabetes, heart disease, in particular hypertension, obesity, you're at increased risk for having complications. The stories you hear of young people having an issue with COVID are rare. 
And that's true for any viral illness. Any viral illness can create these weird responses uh, that are very rare in healthy people. And um, it can cause heart failure, um, it can cause uh, uh, nerve damage. And these are just sort of weird complications that people have in response to viral infections. And COVID has created some of the thing, same things, but I don't think in the end that they will happen any more often than it does with any other virus. In Minnesota, there have been uh, over 14,000 diagnosed COVID patients from age 19 to 24. And there's been one death in that age group. I'm fairly con I don't know who the death is, but I'm fairly confident that it's somebody who was sick. So in your age group, that's a mortality rate that is much higher than the mortality rate of walking out your apartment door, uh, or much lower rather. So I think we as a society need to respond appropriately. And unfortunately, our government has been so inept at its response that no one trusts anything it says anymore on both sides of your opinion. So any nuanced approach now um, is sort of being lost and, and accusations about the motivation behind the changes are questioned. But I think it's happening. Even in Minnesota, I think people are recognizing that there's a differential response that the, we need to protect the highest risk people and that the lowest risk people need to be able to function. Otherwise, they're going to have other issues. Um, what is, uh, you talked about an experience that was very like memorable, but, um, what was a very difficult situation that you had to deal with that you kind of still remember and how did you kind of, um, get through it and has it helped you ever since? Um, I had a patient who came to see me in clinic with, um, she was convinced she had, um, uh, some fatty tumors, some called lipomas that are benign tumors on the outside of her leg or nowhere in her back, in the small of her back. And I couldn't feel anything. And she also had some back pain and some hip pain and she was seeing a whole bunch of different doctors for each of these little um, complaints. And uh, she was a little bit, I, I would, I guess I would describe her as uh, a little bit whiny and difficult to deal with. And she couldn't really pinpoint why she was there to see me. And she was convinced it was something was there and she was irritated that I couldn't feel it. So I ordered a, an MRI of the area to look for this fatty tumor. And the MRI result came back and said, there's nothing in this area, but on the outside of her leg, uh, there's some thickening um, around her hip, and this needs to be, could be evaluated further. And I don't remember what happened after that. I think I got a phone call from my nurse saying, this is the result. There wasn't anything there. And I said, okay, that's fine. And then she said, but there, they have this comment about the hip. And I thought to myself, well, she's seeing a, an orthopedic surgeon for the hip pain. So th that'll be dealt with there. Well, it turns out what that thickening was, was a early sarcoma. And by the time she, um, it was figured out, uh, it had spread all over and she died about two months after that. And so I felt really bad about having missed that um, diagnosis, even though that's not what she was seeing me for. And the system that is set up is so fragmented, you know, that, that no one really owned the whole problem, even though that's how the system's supposed to work. And that I was sort of held responsible for 
everything that the MRI showed, even though what I was looking for with the MRI wasn't there. So that, that was hard for me. I had to talk through it a long time and it kept me up at night lots of times thinking through what did it, what, did, how did this work? How was the flow? What happened? Um, so that's a bad experience I've had. But, uh, this is the last question. And then, um, yes. Um, what is like a common misconception that is made about your profession? Um, I think a common misconception is that doctors uh, make a lot of money and have a lot of time to spend it. Um, you know, there's always a joke about the doctor on the golf course. And while there's some of those, and you know, a lot of us make um, a comfortable living, the vast majority of doctors are not in the 1%. Um, um, there are some that are, um, but we don't all, it's, it's a lot of work. You know, I, my average work week is probably 60 to 80 hours. If I'm in the ICU, that week is about 85 hours long of work. Um, and that's Monday through Sunday. And then I have, you know, the next week I do Monday through Friday. There's no, there's no break in it. I can work. Um, you know, I can take call for two nights and I've worked um, three days work of it, worth of anyone else's work um, or three and a half days. So um, I think that's a big misconception is that doctors make a lot of money and uh, they're rich. What, but I think in today's economy, Doctors make a comfortable living, but doctors don't have time to mow the lawn and don't have time to do a lot of yard work or don't have time to even do housework. So you have to make a lot of money in a way to be, you have to make sufficient money to pay somebody else to do the stuff that you can't do because you don't have time because you're working so much. And, and that's a common, common, common misperception. Okay, well, Dr. Chipman, thank you so much for coming. That was very helpful. And thank you for taking the time to come speak to us, even though it was virtual. Um, My pleasure. Good luck, everyone. Thank you again. You're welcome. Bye. Bye-bye.